Let's stand together. I just feel like something good is about to happen. I just feel like something good is on its way. He has promised that he'd open all of heaven. Brother, this could be that very day when God's people humble themselves and they call on him. And they look to heaven expecting as they pray. It's me like something good is about to happen. Brother, this could be that very day. Well, I just feel like something good is about to happen. I just feel like something good is on its way. He has promised that he'd open all the themselves and they call on Jesus. They look to heaven expected as they pray. I just feel like something good is about to happen. Brother, this could be that very day. Well, I have learned in all that happens just to praise him. I know he's working all things for my good. Every tear I shed is worth all the investment. For I know he'll see me through, he said he would. He has promised I or you can hardly fathom. And the things he had in store for those who pray. I just feel like something good is about to happen. Brother, this could be that very day. Something good is going to happen. Brother, this could be that very day. I just feel like something good is about to happen. Brother, this could be that very day. But we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Sing his mercy and his grace In the mansions bright and blessed He'll prepare for us a place When we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be When we all see Jesus sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful. Every day, just one glimpse of giving glory. Will the doors of life be And shout onward to the path before us. His beauty will be The pearly gates will open. We shall walk the streets of gold when we all get to Get to it. 
as I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day
You're the cup that won't run dry. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Your presence is heaven to me.
let your presence fill this place. Let your presence fill this You may take your seats if you like. Are you ready for the word? Let's turn to Judges chapter 1. Would you please stand with me? Judges chapter 1. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord. You should go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek at Bezek and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table, as I have done. So God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. The men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country, in the Negev, and in the town, in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba, and they defeated Sheshai and Ahiman and Talmai. From there, they went against the inhabitants of Deber, the name of Deber was formerly Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Ekash, my daughter, for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, and he gave him Ekash, his daughter, for a wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have sent me in the land of the Negev. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. The descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, they went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad. And they went and settled with the people. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath, and devoted it to destruction. So the name of that city was called Hormah. Judah also captured Gaza with its territory, and Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. And the Lord was with Judah. And he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the greatness of your power, the purpose of your plan, the fulfillment of your promise, that your word is sure, it's everlasting. It does not fail. I thank you, O oh Lord God Almighty, that through Jesus Christ, every promise you have made to us is fulfilled in him and is at our disposal. I pray that you would help us to live our lives in such a way that we would be victorious and we would leave 
no stragglers behind. Lord, I pray that you give us the grace to hear today what you would be speaking to us by your word. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning is Not Even Chariots. Not Even Chariots. God had made a promise to the people of Israel that he was going to bring deliverance of the people in the land into their hands. So as they went to possess the land, God said, I am with you. I want you to have a look back at uh, the beginning of the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1. So Joshua gives us the history of the people of Israel coming into the land of promise. The end of that book brings us to the end of Joshua's life, the leadership that he brought. Now have a look what he says to us in the first chapter. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Now I want you to pay close attention to what he says. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Notice what he says. I'm going to give you every place the sole of your foot stands or is, is placed, and no man will be able to stand against you. Because of this, he says, I, I want you to be aware I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Church, this is a promise from God Almighty that he had made to their forefather Abraham over 400 years earlier. He says only be strong and what? Very courageous. He's already told them to be strong and courageous. Now he's saying now be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do all according to the... Uh, be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. And this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. Church, you want us to be aware that the secret for the success of Joshua's leadership, his ministry, and the people of Israel was that they would be in the Word of God, meditating upon it day and night. And he says that if you meditate upon this Word day and night, it will make your way prosperous and you will have success. When we are not in the Word of God, meditating upon it, there are other things that are taking its place and bringing influence into our lives, even if we're unaware of it, even if we think contrary-wise, that there's no way that, that the ways of this world or things around me can be uh, infiltrating into my thoughts. But church, the only way that our, uh, our thoughts are strengthened according to godly wisdom is by the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing the Word of God, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Meditate upon this Word day and night, and if you do so, you will be, prosper excuse me, you will be prosperous and you will have success. So this is what Joshua devoted himself to. And we see throughout the book of Joshua that they did have success, but there were occasions that they did not have success. And the, the times they didn't have success were those times when they went about things according to their own logic, according to their own understanding. 
We, we even see to the point that they said the reason that we were unsuccessful, the reason that we were defeated is because we did not wait upon the Lord. We did not wait to hear what the Lord would speak to us in this matter. And we see it on more than one occasion, and we're not going to get into the uh, particulars regarding that, but that we would be aware that when we follow God, when we're in his word, we'll have success and be prosperous. Now, the scripture is not speaking here about uh, health and wealth and going all kinds of uh, crazy bank accounts and never getting sick ever a day in our lives, that sort of thing. When speaking about being prosperous and having success is that knowing that God gives us the victory and that the enemy of our soul will not be able to stand against us. When we are not meditating upon the word day and night, the enemy will come against our soul and will attempt to infiltrate, to get a foothold, and if he's successful doing that, he can influence different areas of our lives. Now, I want you to see what the very next verse ends up telling us. In verse 9, he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? So now three times he said what? Be strong and courageous. He's told us uh, the second time, be strong and very courageous. And then he says this, do not be frightened. Don't be afraid. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord is with you, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How is it that God is with us wherever we go? Even more so, a reality today through Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, than it was for the people of Israel here in the book of Joshua, or the book of Judges, or anywhere else throughout the Old Testament. He is with us wherever we go. It doesn't matter what we're doing, where we are, who we're with, what time of day or night it is. He's with us wherever we go. He's the ultimate chaperone. He's the ultimate protector and shield. He's the ultimate great reward. Why did I bring us back to Joshua? when we're looking at judges. It's because God has made some promises to them. And now Joshua is dead. Now, when we read in Joshua, the Lord says, I will be with you all the days of your life. So now that Joshua is dead, you might say, well, okay, uh, what's going to happen to the people of Israel now? Well, if they keep their eyes on their God, on the God of creation, the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then they will not be afraid and they will not be dismayed. They can be courageous, very strong and very courageous. Now, what is fear? Fear is, our, is the response we have to that which is coming against us. So if something comes against us, we can either be courageous or we can be fearful. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be frightened of that which comes against you or even that which you come against. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 that on this rock, I will build my church. Will you raise your hand if you are the church? On this rock, I will build my church and the Gates of hell shall not stand against it or prevail against it. That means that the church is going to advance. And Jesus is saying as the church advances, the gates of hell will not be able to stop that advance. So by the presence of and the the power and the provision of the Holy Spirit, God is with us wherever we go. Wherever we go. So now Joshua is dead as so we come into the book of Judges. All right, so after the death of Joshua, 
the people Israel inquired of the Lord. Who's going to go up against the Canaanites? Who's going to lead us as we fight? And notice that it wasn't that the people said, uh, I think it would be a good idea for Judah to go. What do we read in verse 2? The Lord said, Judah is going to go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Judah shall go up, and I've given the land into his hand. Church, is that a promise? It's not a suggestion. It's not where the Lord says, well, Josh, uh, 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 Judah, if, if you feel like it, if you want, it's there. So I'll give it to you. This wasn't Judah's idea. This was the Lord's. And then the Lord said to his brothers, to the fellow tribe, Simeon. So here we have Judah leading the attack, continuing on with the attack, because there's already been a lengthy campaign going on in the land. But there's still more land to gain control of. The Lord says, when they were still in the wilderness, I'm not going to drive them all out before you all at once, because if I do, then there will be wastelands left and Wild animals, jackals, and other beasts will come in and overrun the land. So I'm going to give you victory upon victory. So as you encounter the enemy, I will give you victory upon victory upon victory so that everywhere the sole of your feet are placed, I am going to give it to you. No one will be able to stand against you. So Judah whose name means the praise of Yah. Praising God. He leads the advance and he says to his brother, Simeon, Shimon, which means to hear. Hear to obey. Hear for obedience. Let's go and uh, we're going to, uh, you come with me and and then we'll battle together, and then I will go to your territory, and we'll battle together there, and we'll experience the victory of the Lord. And so they saw great and awesome victories. But then we come down to a troubling verse in verse 19, Judges chapter 1. Look at the troubling verse. And the Lord was with Judah. That's good so far, right? And he took possession of the hill country. That's not troubling. That's good. The Lord said that I am with you. I'm going to give them into your hands. So we read in verse 19, The Lord was with Judah, and he, Judah, took possession of the hill country. But he, Judah, could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain. Why? They had chariots of iron. Does that mean that God was powerless against chariots of iron? He's like, oh, I forgot about the chariots. The chariots. What was I thinking? Uh, okay, uh, I should have said, I'm with you and give you victory everywhere the sole of your feet go unless you encounter iron chariots. God knew about the iron chariots already. This is not a surprise to the Lord. So what is going on that it says that he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron? It's because no limitation on God, but a limitation upon Judah's trust in God. See, don't be afraid. Fear is our response to that which comes against us, our reaction to that. But fear doesn't need to be that reaction. It can be faith instead. Remember, the Lord said to Joshua, don't be frightened and do not be dismayed. What does it mean to be dismayed? We know what it is to be afraid or to frighten, be frightened. What does it mean to be dismayed? To be dismayed is when we, when we look at our lack, our inability to stand 
or in and of ourselves to stand against that which comes against us. That's what dismay is. Fear is like, <gasps> and dismay is assessing the situation, realizing the reason I'm afraid and I'm beside myself, dismay, is because I'm looking at myself and I'm looking at the enemy and I'm sizing the enemy up according to me and my abilities and my, stre my strengths and realizing can't be done. That's being dismayed. In and of ourselves, realizing that the enemy, that which stands against us, that which is opposing us, is bigger than we are. That's what it is to be dismayed. And that's what Judah was experiencing here. They were looking at the chariots and they were being frightened and they were being dismayed because they're looking at themselves. Did they have victory in the hill country? Absolutely. No issues in the hill country whatsoever. Why? Because there's no iron chariots there. They had weapons just like they, like, like, like they had. But going down into the plain, now there's all kinds of chariots. But they've already experienced victory down along the coast with Ekron and Ashdod and uh, Gath. That's down on the plain. And this is a certain area, a certain location on the plain that has iron chariots. I'd like for us to go back, if you will, to Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33. This is before... Moses dies and before the people come into the land. Now, to put it into context, you recall last week we looked at Phineas. He was the priest who was zealous for God. Well, then the Lord gave some further uh, instructions after that event takes place in Numbers chapter 25. And to begin carrying out... Uh, the, the punishment upon the Midianites in chapter 31, the Lord gives further directions. And then we see in chapter 33, amongst these directions, instructions for the people, just before they're getting ready to come into the land of promise. Here's what he says in verse 50. The Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, so this means they're right across the river from Jericho. They're ready to go into the land. They can see the land of promise. Ready for the taking. So here's what he says. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their metal images and demolish all their high places. You shall take possession of the land and settle in it. For I have given the land to you to possess it. You shall inherit the land by lot, according to your clans. To a large tribe, you shall give a large inheritance. And to a small tribe, you shall give a small inheritance. Wherever the lot falls for anyone, that shall be his. According to the tribes of your fathers, you shall inherit. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of those of the land from before you, then those of them whom you let remain... They shall be as barbs in your eyes, thorns in your sides, and they'll trouble you in the land where you dwell. And I will do to you as I thought to do to them. God says, wherever, whenever, I will drive them out from before you. Notice what he says about the lot. Did you notice that? He says, you shall inherit the land by lot according to their clans. To a large tribe, you're going to give a large inheritance. To a small tribe, a small inheritance. Wherever the lot falls for anyone, that shall be his. The outcome of the allotment of land for the tribes was according to the Lord. Proverbs tells us that the, the tossing of the lot, man tosses the lot into the lap, but it's, it's every outcome is from 
the Lord. God was telling them, this is how I want you to choose the boundaries, and these will be the places where the various tribes will be settled. Well, what if they got a particularly difficult spot, like Judah, who's experiencing iron chariots in their midst? I wonder if they might have thought, why couldn't my boundaries have been different? Why couldn't I have been settled elsewhere so I wouldn't have to deal with iron chariots? You know that the Lord brings things into our lives so that we can learn to trust him in every situation. Now, I mentioned the title of my message was Not Even Chariots. Not even chariots are stronger than God. Not even chariots can defeat us. And so you and I might see some things in our lives, relationships, that we might say are too far gone. Iron chariots. God can't do anything with that. Or perhaps it's choices that some of your loved ones are making. And you might look at those situations and say, and they're impossible. Those are like iron chariots. We're okay with these other things. We've seen God's promises in these other things, but what we're seeing here, it's an iron chariot, and there's no way that we're going to see any victory here. And so we'll possess the hill country, but we'll, we'll leave the plain, that area. We'll just leave it alone and let the enemies do what they want to do. But notice what the Lord told the people that if you leave the people in that land, what will they be to you? They'll be like barbs in your eyes. They'll be like scourges in your side. They, they are going to be an affliction to you. The Lord said, I will cause them to be routed. You will take possession. God didn't give any qualifiers, did he? No exceptions whatsoever. Let's go to Joshua chapter 17. Joshua chapter 17. I want us to look at the first couple of verses here, and then we're going to jump down to verse 14. So verse 1, Then allotment was made to the people of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph. To Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, were allotted. Now, these are the lands, all right? These, this is the lot that Moses told the people that God said, you're going to inherit the land, and then by lot it will be determined where you will settle. And so we're right in the middle of allotments that are taking place. The lot's being cast, and now we're having some for Manasseh. Uh, chapter 16 is dealing with Ephraim. And so it goes on to speak about various places that were their cities and, and towns in that region, down to verse 14. So we've got Manasseh and Ephraim together. Then the people of Joseph, so the people of Joseph are Joseph's sons. His sons are Manasseh and Ephraim. Then the people of Joseph, so we can read there, so Ephraim and Manasseh, spoke to Joshua, and they said, why have, you, why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance, as though I am an, as though, excuse me, although I am a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me? Joshua said to, to them, if you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest, and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. Now, don't keep reading just for a moment, all right? The, the land they've been given was very spacious, but the cleared land was relatively small. But there was much more land to be cleared. And so jo uh, Joshua said, if the land is too narrow, then go into the forests and clear the land, and you'll have much more room for you. Now, notice, the people of jo Joseph said, The hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron, both those in Beth Shan and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. Then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, To Ephraim 
and to Manasseh. You are a numerous people and you have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron and though they are strong. Is that an encouraging word or not? They're looking at what they have in the hill country. Now, this is further north than where Judah is situated, but they are bordered on a, a plain area as well, the Valley of Jezreel. And they're looking out, and they said, well, what can we do with the, with the valley, with the plain? The people have, the Canaanites have, iron chariots. It's a big area, that plain. It's lush. It's fruitful. It's a very desirable area. But they were almost at the point of saying, we're going to concede, or we will uh, concede it. Is that the right word? We'll let, it, we'll let it remain in the hands of the Canaanites. Because they've got iron chariots. But Josh, Joshua said to them, you are strong. You're great, you, you are large and you have great power. Why do they have great power? Because they're numerous? No, because the Lord is with them. So be strong and courageous. He said, you shall drive out the Canaanites even though they have chariots of iron and though they are strong. See, Iron chariots of the day were sort of like the tank of today in warfare. You can't do hand-to-hand -hand combat with tanks. They'll just mow you down. Iron chariots, they weren't like wooden chariots. They were made of iron, and they were heavy, and they could be destructive, and they would put poles through the front part of the chariot so that it would stick out lengthwise on either side several feet so that as they go to an advancing army coming to, toward them, then they would just drive through that army and unless any of those people were ex ex exceedingly light of foot and able to jump high and fast, they wouldn't be able to outrun or jump over those uh, those rods that were those poles that were sticking out the sides of the chariots and they would just mow them down besides the fact that there would be archers and swordsmen in those chariots as well going along and wreaking havoc now can we go to judges chapter 4 we're going to judges chapter 4 Deborah and Barak. I want you to see something here. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So remember in the book of the Judges, Joshua is dead, the elders are dead, and they're having some trouble. Because they're tending to lean upon their own ideas and logic and wisdom. Just before we continue with chapter 4, will you go back uh, uh, just one, one chapter? Into chapter 2, I guess chapter uh, one and a half chapters. Chapter 2, I want us to discover what happens with the death of Joshua. So we're looking at verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elder who, elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Harris, who's in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and those there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. They didn't know the Lord or the work 
the Lord had done for Israel. And because of that, they, they were overrun, they were overpowered. Because their eyes are not on the Lord, their eyes are on the things around them, the things that were advancing against them. The people did, of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they forgot about their God. And they did evil, but the Lord, as they would cry out, God, help us, he would raise up a judge to lead them for a period of time. When eyes turned to God, all heaven was at the ready to fight on their behalf. All heaven was there to make provision for them. It was already there. They're just now taking advantage, availing themselves of what God had said he would do. See, they had forgotten of what God had done. And they weren't meditating upon the word of God. And as a result, other things were coming in. And they were allowing different people groups of these enemies to remain in the land. And as a result, they were what in their eyes? Barbs. Stacking wood yesterday. And a bit of wind picked up as I was uh, had a couple of pieces of wood in my hand. And there was some sawdust on it. And all of a sudden, the sawdust was lifted with the wind and made its way into my eye. Uncomfortable. and blinds you for a second. You can still see things, but you're not looking at anything clearly. Nothing like barbs in eyes, is it? Hooks. Thorns. See, what it's speaking about is that you won't be able to see clearly because they will have your attention focused on other things. It'll be like scourges on your sides. Anybody deals with pain, you know what it's like trying to give attention and focus on something or someone for any length of time when that thing has just got you seared or wherever the pain might be. Toothache, headache, backache, shoulder, wherever the place might be, all over. Anybody like that? So, Chapter 4, I want you to see what happens. The Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Why? Because he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. It's the fulfillment of Numbers chapter 33, isn't it? Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramath, or excuse me, Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned, summoned Barak, the son of Abinom, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor and take 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and from the people of Zebulun. And I'll draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops. And what's going to happen? And I will give them into your hand. Church, these are iron chariots, and he has 900 of them. I want you to notice something that takes place. Look at verse 12. When Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him, from Harosheth Hagoim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him, and the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. 
Barak pursued the chariots and the army of Herosheth Hagoim and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. What did God promise the people of Israel back in Joshua chapter 1? No man will be able to stand against you. Yes? What was it that Barak needed? He was just a farmer. What was he going on? The word of God and nothing else. It didn't make sense. How was it that he was able with 10,000 men to defeat this massive army with 900 chariots of iron? We read that Sisera got down from his chariot and he ran away on foot. If you're on chariots, you don't run away on foot. What do you do? You stay in your chariot and you keep on going or riding around and you wreak havoc upon the enemy. But he runs away from his chariot. Why? We read about it in chapter 5. Look at verse 19. The kings came, they fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh by the river, by the waters of Megiddo. Megiddo is just on the outskirts of, uh, around the rim of the, the valley of Jezreel. On the other side of the valley is Mount Tabor. And running through the valley is the river Kishon. You remember Elijah? He took the prophets of Baal down Mount Carmel, which is on the uh, western end of the Jezreel Valley takes them down and kills them where? Beside the brook Kishon. We've been there and the, the river or the brook Kishon is not a big river at all. But by the waters of Megiddo, they got no spoils of silver. From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. March on, my soul, with might. The torrent Kishon? The Kishon is just a small river. But what God had done is he had brought torrential rains and caused the Kishon to overflow its banks, causing the Jezreel Valley in that region to become a marshy wetland so that the iron chariots are going to, what, what's going to happen to them now? They're heavy, they're big, and they're going to be weighted down in the mud that they are creating because of the soft, soggy ground. Church, is there anything too big for God? What about iron chariots? See, what? Barak was going on was the word of God. What was Ephraim and Manasseh going on? It was the word of God. No exceptions. Nothing outside of God's command or outside of God's power, outside of God's sovereignty. And where's the first time that we're seeing Israel encountering chariots? Back in Exodus chapter 14. When Israel becomes a nation, they're formed together now, not just as the uh, tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, but now through what God is about to do, bringing them out of Egypt, about to be birthed as the nation and brought them now into the wilderness and they're hemmed in by the wilderness and by the mountains and by the Red Sea that's behind them. And what did God allow happen? Mo, uh, Pharaoh he raises up his army after that tenth plague, after he says, go, just get out of here, be gone. Then he realized, what have I done? I've let them go. See, Satan, he'll try to come back when we've gotten victory, when we realize the victory is ours in Jesus Christ. He will try to come back to test our awareness of our resolve, of our confidence, recognizing that we are strong and very courageous when our eyes are upon the Lord, when our eyes are on the Word. And Pharaoh raises up his army and all of the chariots and sends them in hot pursuit. Why? The Lord says, 
I will cause Pharaoh to think that you are wandering aimlessly and you don't know what you're doing, where you're going. And God basically says, you don't, but I do. And you're not wandering. I'm leading you. And he brought them to where they were intentionally so that they would be confronted with this massive army and all of these chariots. And what did God do? He says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Watch what I'm going to do. The pillar of cloud by day, which became a pillar of fire by night, went and separated the two. And it was light for all of Israel, but it was darkness for the Egyptian army. And all through the night, the Lord pushed back the waters of the Red Sea. And we know the story well, don't we? And he leads the people of Israel across to the other side through that seabed, which is now dry. It's a highway on the ocean floor. See, the same God who can make a dry field, massive field, soggy like a swampland, can also take the seabed and turn it into a dry highway. And leads them through to the other side, lures the Egyptian army into, the, into that sea highway, thinking they're going to be victorious, but oh no. They don't realize who they're messing with, even though they've already had ten rounds with this God. And the last Israelite foot or hoof, whichever it was, whether it was the animals were last or the people were last, not one left behind. Not one. And then the Lord said to Moses, lift up your hands. The waters came back upon themselves. And every single one of those Egyptian soldiers, horses, along with their chariots, were drowned in the sea. So that there was a song that was raised up in Exodus chapter 15, and you know the song, right? I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. And then you repeat it. Do we know that here? The Lord my God, my strength, my song, has now become my victory. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, has now become my victory. I started high. The Lord, Lord is, Lord, Lord, Lord. Uh, uh, <laughs> the Lord, Lord. Maybe I should just go back to what I was doing. Um, can you help me out, Rick? Do you know it? You don't know it. Praise him. Now my wife is singing too low for me. <laughs> we got to finish the song. The Lord is God and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is God and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Amen. See, the people of Israel during Joshua's day and through the judges says, remember that this is the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt. We just read it here in chapter 4 of Judges, the God who brought you up out of Egypt, reminding them of the Egyptian devastation. Trust in the Lord. Be strong and very courageous. Why? Because the Lord... Your God is with you. Can we conclude by going ahead two books, Romans chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 13. Romans chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse 31 of Romans 8, and I'd like for us to stand as we conclude with the reading of these passages. We're going to allow them to be what goes out in our ears today. 
What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Church, this is referring to any sin, any habit. Because the Lord has promised that sin shall not have mastery over us, shall not have dominion. Because the power of of God through the resurrected Jesus, because of his payment for our sin, he's destroyed the power of sin and death in our lives. We need to be careful that we don't believe the lie that that iron chariot can't be dealt with. We're just going to have to live with it. And it deals, as I already mentioned, no matter what relationship or, or family members are dealing with, that we not write it off or say, well, okay, I guess we'll just have to grin and bear it. No, sir, no. No, ma'am. Don't grin and bear it. Go in the Word of God, being strong and very courageous. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who's going to bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. He's with us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. See, that's what the world looks at us as. That's what the devil looks at us as. But no, in all these things, we are more than what? How? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not, all right, guys, we're more than conquerors. Booha! No, we're not more than conquerors if it's just we're more than conquerors. If it's just we're more than conquerors, we're just like Judah. We'll take the hill country because we can manage that. We can trust God for the hill country, but we'll leave the plain for somebody else because, well, God can't handle iron chariots. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's for us. So if he's for us, then who can be against us? Anybody? Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse 5, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Why? For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Where did he say that? Back in Joshua chapter 1. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Well, how do we know that that's applied to us today? Well, Hebrews is for us today. The New Testament, it's for us today. How do we know that it's for us today? Well, it says, um, the Lord is my helper. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way, their way of life, and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same when? And when? So yesterday and today and forever. See, Jesus, was he was fighting for the people of Israel back in the book of Joshua in that period of history. How do we know? Because we're told about it in Joshua chapter 5 when Jesus appears to Joshua and gives him the, the plan how to beat Jericho and led them all through the way. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So do not be led away by diverse and strange teaching. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, 
not by foods which have been benefit which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the blood, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin, they're burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Don't neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Take what we have and give it to others. Take this. Walk in his name and his strength and his power and don't put up any qualifiers. No iron chariots, no wooden chariots, no horses, no riders. There's some people who trust in those things. Psalm 46 says, God destroys the chariot, burns them with fire. It says that outright. 20, verse 7. It says that some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. For they are brought down, and they are fallen. But we are established, and we stand upright. Lord, would you take these feeble individuals that stand before you today and help us, Lord, the things that we have left as they are, just to say, well, I guess we just have to let it be. Lord, rather, we would stand and say, no. We're not going to leave any portion to the enemy. Nothing in our own lives, our own thoughts. Lord, we'll give our hearts and minds to the meditation of your word. Church, would you just take a moment and just allow the Lord to point out if, if you've not already identified something that may not be there right now, but if there's any iron chariots, as it were, in your life or in your family, something that you've been limiting God by and say, well, it's just, no, that, I don't see how that's going to ever change. Would you just say, Lord, are there any iron chariots that I've allowed to remain in my life, my home, my family, and I've not trusted you with? And would you give it to him and say, Lord, I don't want to limit you anymore. Lord, we, we offer to you every doctrine, every teaching, every thought that comes our way that is not of you. And we subject ourselves to this glorious word that is the authority. The authority for our lives. And that which leads us every step of the way so that everywhere the soles of our feet do get placed. We would experience the victory and the promises that are ours through Jesus Christ, knowing that the steps of a righteous person is ordered by you. So, Lord, would you lead us? And as we trust you to do so, 
We would not try to turn to the right or to the left thinking that this is better or stop before you say to stop thinking that it's better. And that we would not complain about what you have set out for us in the life that we are living in, our background and experiences. Because you're the God who redeems, the God who restores, the God who leads every step of the way. And we'll see iron chariots fall and be devastated all around us. Heaven fighting for us. Because you're on our side. Or rather, we're on your side. And we rejoice in you, Lord. We offer to you the sacrifice of praise. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to the Lord our God. Because we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord our God, church. Let's leave this place in victory and have our eyes on him. And if there's things that you find that get um, presented to you like an iron chariot, that you don't limit them or accept the arguments that those, those enemies might try to bring to you. Say, no, 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 my God has promised victory. So I'm going with his word in Jesus' name.